Well, good morning and welcome to Providence Presbyterian Church. My name is David Ray, one of the pastors on staff, and we are delighted to have you with us virtually this morning as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. On Palm Sunday, we very much wish we could be together uh, worshiping the Lord. We miss you. We love you. We care for you. Our elders and deacons are reaching out to you and are praying for you, and we long to be together again. Uh, before we worship, just a few announcements uh, for your consideration. Good morning. I'm Jonathan Smith, the coordinator of music here at Providence, and I welcome you again to this service. As we did last week, we have a couple of songs incorporated into the service. The lyrics to those songs are in your worship guide this week, and I encourage you to follow along and sing along at home as you follow the service. Thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Nate Libby, the youth pastor here at Providence, and it has been so good connecting with all of our youth over the weeks. Um, this past week we had a great Zoom meeting with the middle school. I had a fun time catching up with you guys. I miss you guys. This week, uh, actually this afternoon, we are going to have a Zoom meeting for the high school at 4 p.m. Invites have been sent out and they uh, will have a reminder at around 2 or 3 o'clock this afternoon. Hope you guys can make it. We're gonna continue doing these Zoom meetings and just trying to keep in touch, catch up, and do short devotionals. Praying for you guys and hope all is well. Good morning. My name is Allison Averitt and I lead women's ministry here at Providence. Uh, I wanted to let you know that we had our first ladies Zoom meeting this last Sunday evening at 7.30 and it was Wonderful! It was such a sweet time to get to see each other's faces and encourage one another and uh, pray for one another. And we are going to continue to have that same prayer meeting every Sunday evening at 7.30 p.m. I'll be sending out an email every week with information about women's ministry that includes information about how to uh, be on that Zoom call. And uh, we would love for you to join us. Additionally, uh, we will make an announcement next week about another way we can be connecting over the word together during this time. So if you are, have not, are not receiving that email to all of our women and would like to, um, my email is on our website. Please email me and I'll be sure to include you in all that information. Thanks so much. To prepare our hearts for worship, I'm going to read from Spurgeon's devotional morning and evening from the morning of April 4th, which is based on 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. O oh, mourning Christian, why are you weeping? Are you despondent over your sin? Well, look to your perfect Lord and remember, you are complete in Him. You are in God's sight as perfect as if you had never sinned. No, more than that, the Lord our righteousness has put a divine garment upon you so that you have more than the righteousness of man. You have the righteousness of God. Your standing is not in yourself. It is in Christ. And you are as much accepted today with all of your sinfulness as you will be when you stand before his throne free from all corruption. I beseech you to lay a hold of this precious thought. You are complete in him. And so let your face forever wear a smile, for soon when your time has come, you shall rise up where your Jesus sits and reign at his right hand. And all of this because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Beloved, let's prepare our hearts for worship.
morning our call to worship comes from Romans 11 and Revelation 7. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather together and worship you in spirit this morning. We ask that as we take time to sing and to praise you, to pray together and to hear your word preached, we ask that you would bless this time, that you would encourage us, that you would make us more like Christ our Lord, and that we would be reminded of the great salvation we have in him. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our confession this morning is from Psalm 118. And if you look at the final bold words in the confession in your worship guide, they're very fitting and familiar for Palm Sunday. They read, O Lord, save us, which in Hebrew is Hoshiana or Hosanna. These are the words that the people cried out when Jesus came on the donkey in the triumphal entry. Over time, though, this phrase has shifted. For the original readers of Psalm 118, it was a plea for deliverance. When Jesus came marching in, it was a declaration that salvation was now. And so as we come and confess our faith, what we are confessing is that salvation, the long-awaited Messiah, has come on Palm Sunday. Let's do so together now. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.
Past week, I was reminded of a quote from one of our Scottish forefathers in the faith, Thomas Chalmers. He wrote a book called The Expulsive Power of a New Affection. Here's the thesis. The root power of sin is severed by the power of a superior pleasure, a more compelling joy. Friends, as we struggle with fear and doubt, let's turn our focus to a superior pleasure really, to a superior person, the Lord Jesus. The more we focus on him, the more our fears and doubts will be pushed to the side. Let us now confess our sins before our righteous and holy God. O my Savior, help me. I am slow to learn and quick to forget. I am pained by my graceless heart my prayerless days, and my sullied conscience. I am blind while your grace shines around me. Take the scales from my eyes and help me to repent of my unbelief. Make it my highest joy to study thee, meditate on thee, and gaze on thee. Enable me by your Spirit to grow in grace so that there may be more fervor in my devotion and more constancy in my zeal. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now hear the promises of God to those who truly repent of their sins and trust in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. Please pray with me. On this Palm Sunday, we thank you that you are the triumphant king, that you sent your son Jesus to earth as a baby, that he lived perfectly and that he carried out your plan and died on the cross for our sins. Help us not forget that without his death and resurrection, we would be dead in our sins and without hope. In this time when so many seem to be low on hope because of their current health situations or economic situations, help us to remember that our hope is not in our gifts, our power, or our wisdom. But our hope is in Jesus Christ, his death, and his resurrection. We praise you this morning for your answer to our prayers and for Bob Nelson's release from the hospital to continue to recover from the coronavirus at home. Continue to strengthen him, heal him, and be with him and his family in this time. We thank you for how you have protected our church family in terms of health and employment during this pandemic so far. 
We know that you are in control of each and everything, and we ask for your continued protection of each of us and our loved ones. But dear Lord, we know that many have not been as fortunate. Many are sick. Many have lost loved ones and friends. Many have lost their jobs and businesses. We pray for each and every person who is suffering in these ways. Help us to love them as you love them, and help us to actively look for ways to love them and point them to you. Dear Lord, many of us are experiencing situations that we haven't before or never thought we would. We're working remotely, taking classes from home, homeschooling our children, and feeling anxious, trapped, or lonely from being in our homes day after day and week after week without our normal schedules, activities, and interactions. Through all these challenges, we ask that you would focus our hearts and minds on you. Help us to rely on you, to remember that you never change, that you are in control of all things, that you have provided for all of our needs. Help us to be more thankful for how you have blessed us and protected us. This morning, we also pray for the leaders of our city, state, and country. Give them wisdom. Surround them with those who will inform and equip them to make the difficult decisions that seem to confront them daily. This morning, please bless the preaching and hearing of your word. Please guide Dave's words and open each of our hearts to hear what you have to say through him. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this Palm Sunday morning. Well, I, like you on this particular morning, have probably experienced uh, some of the anxiety and the apprehension that goes along with the uncertainty of the times that we find ourselves in. They are unprecedented. And this morning, instead of dwelling on those kind of times, I want to really focus in on a event that transcends all of those, an event, if you would, by a person who transcends time and eternity. We're going to focus, obviously, this morning on that first Palm Sunday over 2,000 years ago. Now, if I remember correctly, I probably preached over 35 Palm Sunday sermons, but never on a Sunday like this. And so I've taken a new approach to this text, an approach that I have never taken before. It's going to be different, and hopefully it is going to be positively different for all of us. The Mount of Olives for Jesus was a very special place. The Mount of Olives is to the east of Jerusalem. It's, it's higher than the Temple Mount, and from there you can see what was then the great Herodian Temple. The Gospel writers tell us that Jesus spent a lot of time on the Mount of Olives. In fact, every night in the week that will be ahead, he will go to the Mount of Olives in the evening. And that final night when he was arrested before he is crucified, he is on the Mount of Olives. The parade, if you would, it is taking place on Palm Sunday, departs from the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus, when he was raised from the dead and was ascending into heaven, he was with his apostles on the Mount of Olives. And the angel told the apostles as they watched him go that he would return to this very place. So it was, if you would, one of his favorite places. And that's where the account begins that we're going to look at this morning. So if you would, uh, look at me with... Uh, the scriptures in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 13. You're also going to find in uh, your online worship guide a outline for this particular message. But let's look together at the Word of God then as we find it in this 21st chapter of Matthew. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. 
If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and the other cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as you have given us your word this morning. We pray that by your spirit, you would empower the proclamation of your word, the hearing of your word, and the application of your word to each one of us, that we may see this day the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, that work that he would begin on Palm Sunday that would mean for us and all of his people life and life everlasting. And we ask and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. In World War II, D-Day was June 6th, 1944. And on that D-Day, Dwight Eisenhower, who was the Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, wrote a letter to those that were about to begin the invasion. The letter in part read as follows. Soldiers, sailors, airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark on a great crusade. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in the free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. And let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. And so, as we approach this text, what I would like you to think about this morning is on that first Palm Sunday, what was it that was really happening? And as you do that, Consider the fact that ever since the fall in Eden, when mankind gave up all the promises of paradise in exchange for sin and death, the whole creation has been waiting for redemption. And so when this moment comes, this first Palm Sunday arrives, all history is waiting. History was waiting for this. Consider the reasons why. First of all, prophecy is being fulfilled. What was happening on that day was spoken by the prophet Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9 of his book. He simply says what is repeated for us in the scripture of the morning. 
Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a beast of burden. It was 400 years before this event took place that the Spirit of Christ had inspired the prophet Zechariah to write this. Other prophets had prophesied the same thing. This moment, this event, was in Almighty God's battle plan to retake and redeem His creation and His people from the very beginning. Again, all this is confirmed by us, to us by the reality that providence had made its preparation. If you look at verses 1 through 3, you see that this parade, if you would, would begin on the Mount of Olives. The humble donkey that was going to carry the Messiah had been appointed from the beginning. It was tethered in Bethpage, and the ones that owned it were made ready to let it go for the use of the Lord. It was all prepositioned. The providence of God had prepared for this very moment. So ultimately what we say as we think about this is that the time had come. The time had come. Many times prior to this, Jesus had refrained from going up to Jerusalem. He had refrained from trying to gather a crowd or draw support in the city or to have a popular uprising led by him. And he refrained from doing this because he said his time had not yet come. But now it had come. This was the moment. The time had come. All of his life and ministry was a preparation for this day. Now, many of you have probably watched documentaries on the preparations for D-Day. And, and you know, if you watch those documentaries, that was massive preparation. It was massive preparation to prepare, if you would, for the beginning of the battle to defeat the empire of the twisted cross. And after that, that was only preparation. It was only the beginning. And after D-Day, there would be a year of heavy fighting ahead before full victory would come. So this day, this first Palm Sunday, was D-Day for our Lord Jesus Christ. He was beginning his assault to defeat his and our enemies and bring redemption and full salvation. Seven days after this day, full victory would be claimed in his resurrection, but the intervening six days would be filled with the greatest battle ever fought. You see, Almighty God, his Father, is not making up his plan of redemption, his plan of redemption for us. This day was in the strategic plan from the beginning. That honored lowly donkey appointed for Jesus to ride was in the plan before time began. We were in the plan before time began. And no matter what is happening with the coronavirus today, God's plans for His people through the work of His Son are on track. We need to understand that on this Palm Sunday, Jesus was on a mission as much as those soldiers and sailors and airmen were on a mission on that first D-Day. The Apostle John in his first letter says it this way. He simply says this to us. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. You see, history is his story. History is the story of God's redemption through his Son. And as monumental and as hard as the week would be ahead, it would happen. One of the things I left out when I read General Eisenhower's letter, is in the last line he wished the soldiers and sailors and airmen good luck. But no good luck would be needed on this occasion 
No good luck would be needed on this occasion because of who it was that rode that lowly donkey. And who rode that donkey down the hill from the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem? It was the king. The king was coming to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the earthly type of the heavenly Zion. And the rider on the donkey that day was the true king of Zion, the true leader of heaven's army. Lord Sabaoth rode that lowly donkey. And that day, the armies of heaven were as much with him as he rode that donkey as they will be on the day he returns from Zion upon his white war horse. You see, it was not how he came, but it was who was coming. He was coming as king, and as coming as king, he was coming to his city. His city is Jerusalem. Jerusalem's built on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah was the place where Abraham was told to take his only son Isaac and sacrifice him. And as Isaac and Abraham are climbing the hill to Moriah, Isaac being a bright young lad, notice the fire, and he noticed the wood, but he didn't see a sacrifice. And he said to his father Abraham, where is the sacrifice? And his father told him, on the mount the Lord will provide. And on that mountain a humble lowly ram was caught in a thicket by the horns, and it was the substitute for Isaac. And it was that ram that died and not Isaac. And Jesus says in this Gospel of John that Abraham saw his day. And the day that Abraham saw Christ's day was the day that the substitute was provided for his son Isaac. And so it was Jesus who was coming back to his city for the type of Christ in that ram was slain on that mountain and Christ must come back there that his life and his blood would be poured out. And he was coming back to his city, coming as king, but he was coming in humility, not with the glory that he had with the Father before time began, but in humble obedience that would take the Son of God to the same place where that ram died to save Isaac. The Lion of Judah was coming as the lamb. He was coming as the lamb because he was coming to save. And the crowd shouted and hollered out, Hosanna, Hosanna, which literally means save, Lord, or to save. They were crying out for him to save. He was the king, great David's greater son. They had that right. He was the king. But he wasn't the kind of king that they were expecting, the king that would deliver them from the reign of Rome. But this was a king that would deliver them from a more terrible reign, the reign of sin and death. And he wouldn't do it man's way, he would do it God's way. Man's way is a lot like the subjects dying for the sovereign. But God's way is where the sinless sovereign dies for his sinless subjects. The rock of ages was about to be smitten. The Passover lamb was soon to be slain, and it would only be a few days before the good shepherd would lay down his life for the sheep. So what do you see on this Palm Sunday? Do you hail your Redeemer as he heads into battle to die for you? If you do, then Palm Sunday, the remembrance of it, that this day and the remembrance of Jesus and what he was doing should have more gravity for us than all the D-Days of the world. For this was the great transcending D-Day of time and eternity. For Christ the King was coming. And in that way of coming, as they came, if you would, to the assault of Europe, the similarity is clear. The king was coming to conquer. 
This was the beginning of his assault to destroy the work of the devil and the grip that he had upon God's world. He was coming to conquer by reclaiming Zion. This was the place where the father said he would put his name and he was coming to reclaim it, to make sure that this was the place where his blood was poured out. That is in most strategic battles. The high ground is one with blood that is spilt. In this high ground, this place would be one with the blood of the lamb that would be spilt on its ground. The slain lamb was the lion. And that slain lamb would soon raise his banner, not a twisted cross of ruin, but a rugged cross of redeeming love. But before that, he would begin by reclaiming his house. He would enter the temple. And I propose, I propose to you that he entered the temple in power and in might and in majesty. Why do I say that? The money changers, the people selling pigeons, the temple security guard, they did nothing. He overturned the tables and the stools. He completely shut it down. There was no opposition to him for the effulgence of his power went forth and there was no resistance. And as he was there reclaiming his father's house, he said, you have made literally a money machine. You're a den of robbers. And that den of robbers had robbed him of the worship that was due to him and they had pillaged the people's privilege of prayer. The king had come and the king meant business. He was beginning the battle for the final victory. The beachhead was established. The battle was engaged. And in five days, despite all the opposition of rage that Satan could throw at him, and bearing the wrath of God for you and for me, he would declare it was finished what he began on D-Day. On that Friday, he would say from the cross, it is finished, it is done. The victory is won. Now, on 5 June 1944, General Eisenhower penned a note on paper which he threw in the trash. That note on 5 June was his apology in the case that the evasion failed. It read as follows. Our landings at Cherbourg and Havre have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based on the best information available. The troops, the air, and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion and duty could do. If there is any blame or fault to the attempt, it is mine alone. You see, there was a possibility that D-Day invasion would fail. There's no possibility that this D-Day invasion would fail. It had been planned from the beginning of time and it could not fail because it was the work of Almighty God. And what that began, God will finish. And I wonder, on that Palm Sunday, as Jesus was descending from the Mount of Olives on that lowly donkey, if he remembered the verse that he inspired to that same prophet Zechariah, to be found later in chapter 14 of his letter, and in chapter 14, verse 4, recalling what the angels had said 
to the disciples on the Mount of Olives. The same day, the same way you have seen him go, you will see him return to this place. 400 years before then and 2,400 years before now, Zechariah wrote this. On that day, the day of the Lord, his feet, the feet of the Lord, will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and it will split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half of it moving south. It will be on that day that all that we've begun on Palm Sunday will in fact be consummated. Zion will come, the new heavens and the new earth. All of God's people will be taken to be with him. And so on this Palm Sunday today, let us rejoice because Jesus Christ came to conquer and to redeem. And what he began then is in the process of being fulfilled even now. And no matter what is going on in our world, we know what the future holds because we know the one who holds the future was the one who rode into Jerusalem that day to begin our redemption and full salvation. So this Palm Sunday, I urge you not only to put your faith in Christ if you have not done so, but to keep your faith in Christ, understanding that as much as he was victory over sin and death on the cross in the week that was ahead, he is victory over all things that oppose his purposes for this world and for his people. Take your security from the knowledge that the very king is the one who is our deliverer and our liberator. Let's pray. Father in heaven, help us on this Palm Sunday to really lay hold of the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great liberator, the one who came to defeat his and our enemies, to set us, the captives, free, and to grant us eternal life. Let us lay hold to those truths in our heart and not let them go and give us the hope and peace and rejoicing that we should have in those great blessings as you by your grace enable us to endure and even triumph over this present day. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. And now, receive the blessing and the benediction of our God. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you from this time forth and forevermore. Amen.